What's going on, guys? Today we're uh, we're here with two uh, legends in uh, with Brett Contreras at the Glute Lab, and uh, pretty much barely sitting because he put us out for the workout, and uh, glutes are, are pumped up. And Jay Ferruja, and I uh, wanted to do an interview actually because I was like, man, this is a perfect scenario to talk about two things that I, I really love, which is glute training, but um, joint friendly training. And you know, for for guys that have been in the industry for well, shit, we've all been in you know almost decades or decades. Uh, and love to still be strong, look good, but not be beat up. And just like both of you guys' experiences, actually just, you know, kind of go back and forth on this, but um, I'll start with you, Brad. Like, your thoughts on, like, you know, basically, you train still a lot of people, but when, you know, obviously the route of physique and transformations, but your thoughts around, like, man, if, you know, uh, looking back through your career, what would be your biggest points in your thought process for somebody that, that wants to, you know, look great, build muscle, still be strong, but be able to like go for it for, for a long time, meaning like, hey, I'm still 50, I'm 55 and 60, and I'm not beat up and barely walking around uh, because I did 20 years of strength training that, that crushed my joints. So uh, it's funny, my, my friend Ben Bruno and I talk about this a lot, like, man, we overtrained in our 20s, but we all did. Well, it's not quote unquote overtraining syndrome, but we overdid it. We did too many sets. We worked out too hard. You can look back and, you know, when you take every set to utter failure where you're, and, you know, Ben has sets of him doing leg press where his nose starts bleeding in the middle. And it <laughs> keeps going, it keeps going. But it's, but it's like, look, we were the ones who stuck with it. We were, all of us, we stuck with it. It's almost like that enthusiasm is what, it's like a, a prerequisite to, uh, and, but you have to learn the hard way and then you think you're invincible and you can deadlift heavy twice a week and squat hard as hell two, three times a week and, and bench and military press and do weighted chin-ups and weighted dips. And then, and you, you feel like you're indestructible and all of a sudden, one day you hurt yourself. Okay, then you get better and then you hurt yourself again. And after you've hurt yourself several times, you start to go, eh, I need to, I don't like being injured. I like training and this isn't fun being on the sidelines or trying to train around stuff, not being able to do my favorite lifts. And then you kind of reach a stage where you, uh, well, whenever you're hurt, that's your biggest learning. Uh, it takes place during those times. Is when you, you hurt yourself and you're like, well, what can I do? And you realize, oh my God, I'm doing this lift that I thought was stupid and I actually really love it. You know, I would have never thought that I would have liked this single leg movement or this poster chain exercise. I thought, I just like doing deadlifts, but now I'm doing these and I actually really like them. So your arsenal expands. And then you reach a point where you're like, okay, I can train the big lifts less frequently and I can kind of, as long as I'm doing my single leg training, as long as I'm doing hip thrusts, as long as I'm doing all these other exercises, my the, these lifts stay strong because they all contribute, they all help out, you know? When you're doing back extensions, reverse hypers, those are the same hip hinge pattern. When you're doing single leg, you know, Bulgarian split squats and lunges, those are like doing squats on one leg. And then I think you get to a point where we're at right now. You know, you said you were 30, 30 38, 45, 43, and we've been lifting for 25 years each. And, uh, and that's when you're like, okay, I, most important is that I, I want to look good and be health and feel healthy and be able to move around and not wake up feeling completely destroyed and not having achy knees and a sore back. So how can you achieve that the best way? And that's where you come into the more joint friendly training where you, you and this is where you have this uh, awakening where you're like, machines are good. <laughs> you know, the, this, the advice we gave 20 years ago was like, don't do Smith machine squats, Smith machines for pussies and don't do, you know, like you got to do your squats and deadlifts or else machines you're not Machines are non-functional. Yeah. 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 When I've been in, uh, I don't know how many professional weight rooms and there's machines everywhere. <laughs> yeah. True. NFL. Well, yeah, you, yeah. I mean, yeah. down the street is there's this gym called VJ. It's, it's amazing. It's got so many, so many machines there. And what's so cool about it is like I had, my, my pec was hurting and I'm like, I'm, I'm going to go there for a few weeks. And if I did the pec deck with the handles, it hurt. But if I did this pec deck, mm -hmm the old school, and I don't even know, they don't even have a manufacturer on it. It's like from the 70s. This thing's rusty and like, but it works amazing and I could get an awesome pec workout and it didn't hurt. Yeah. Whatever it is about this versus this, um, 
I could do it just fine. Yeah. If you have enough machines, you can find something right. to train around everything. So I, 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 here's what I kind of think. First of all, we're very clicky in, in our industry. Oh, it's like a religion, yeah. Fitness is yeah. religion. Yeah. But second of all, you want to feel like you're, like we all, you had a gym in New Jersey mm -hmm. for how many years? 15 years. 15 years. You have a gym in Seattle for how long? 11, 14 times so then, yeah. yeah. 14 years of owning a gym, you don't want to feel like you're shortchanging your members. Yeah. So you're like, you look around at what you have and you want to be like, we can, I can do everything in here. <laughs> like a, a CrossFit gym owner. They're not going to want to be like, well, ideally I need another 100 grand and, and another you know, 3,000 square feet to really be able to do everything in here. Yeah. Well, obviously CrossFit, you try to get good at CrossFit. But uh, yeah, for physique purposes and for even for function, um, you know, there was just a study published and it pissed some people off. It was in beginners, but it showed that machine, like the line leg press or the line squat machine transferred just as well as, yep. as back squats for performance. So I think we need to get out of, get out, get away from this attitude that we all probably had. I know I certainly did where it was like, machines are for sissies and you know, well, just do free weight. You gotta squat, if you don't squat deadlift, you're, you're not, you're, you're not going to maximize your, your, your gains, your performance, your strength. And who cares what you can leg press? Who cares what you can do off the Smith machine? Who cares? And then it's like you get to a point where we're probably all at like, oh, if, I, if it feels good on my joints and I feel it working the muscle good, I will do it. And the thing is, which says something, now go ahead. No, I was going to say, that's really intelligent training in a nutshell. Is okay, what can you do safely that fits your unique structure? in a way with picture perfect technique that allows you to smartly progressive overload over time. If a back squat doesn't do that for you, why would you walk around? Like, how is that functional or athletic if all oh, my hips and back and knees hurt every time I back squat, but I have to do it because it's functional, it's athletic. It's stupid. But, it, but you can't even see the thing is, for instance, for me right now, if I wanted to go and do a heavy three rep back squat, my brain, like as soon as I set up, I'm like, I feel a little twinge. What happens with your brain? Yeah. You down regulate, right? Because you start, fear starts kicking in. When I go on that, I can push the crap out. I can push the crap out of the belt squat without going like, dude, load it up as heavy as you can. Yeah. Now, my question for you guys is this, right? Like, um, I think that there's, you know, I still deadlift, and, and, but the frequency is way less, and now plugging in a lot more of this, and coming back, and you know, my PRs are still there. Yeah. Can you, you know, can you get really strong? Taking a lot of that out, and it's still really, because I mean, I think my answer is like when Brett said learn when you get injury. Mm -hmm. Nine years ago, horrible back injury, uh, tons of single leg work. That's when I started really hip thrusting a, a ton. Um, after, you know, obviously like I'll be on your blog, look at that and go like, okay man, let's, let me go for this. And what, two years later when I started deadlifting heavier again, once I felt safe, I PR'd on it. Right now, I don't know what the hell, you know, but obviously all that stuff carried over enough and because I didn't have pain, my performance went up. Like my right. photo, I, I think I jumped at least on, on, on the box, we're doing some tests, some of the highest I ever did. And, and I think it's important for people to not be afraid to drop that stuff, yeah. right? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. oh man, but listen, I stopped sumo deadlifting and deadlifting, and now I'm afraid that I won't get stronger, but I'm like, but if you can stay safe and keep pushing without having joint speed up, you'll, you'll get stronger, you know, more consistently than you will with- That was kind of a realization for me, like in 2001, when I got really into Westside, after being into more like five by five and powerlifting stuff, was um, the, 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 the low volume and frequency that they did, did big lifts. And Louis was smart enough to understand that like if you're squatting a ton on Tuesday, the assistance work's gonna be super joint friendly. Like they did a lot of reverse hypers, a lot of glute hands, a lot of chest supported rows, uh, things like that. They weren't doing like heavy squats, heavy RDLs, heavy this. It was like pump work, all like single joint safe pump work. And I was like, no, oh, maybe there's something to that. If we can't keep going through workouts and going five by five and everything, for especially at our age. Which, which was a decade for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back now. Yeah. I think uh, I'm well suited to answer this question because a uh, few, few different case studies on me. Okay, so this happened one time where I hadn't done any deadlifts in a while, but I had you guys do those Nordics today. Yeah. I mean, how hard did those hit your Holy hamstrings? Shit. Right. I just started doing Nordics really hard, but I also was only doing stiff legs. And I remember I started with like 315, and I got up to where I could do 405 for 10, stiff leg deadlifts. Now I've done them for 15, that's my all-time PR for stiff legs. But I remember I worked up to where I could do them for 10 reps, 
and I would only do one all out set, but I was crushing stiff legs, norics, and then I was also doing squats and hip thrusts, but I hadn't done an actual sumo deadlift in a long time. Well, I, I trained at this powerlifting gym and set up my camera and I wanted to see what I could pull and I hit 603. And I was like, funny how that works, that went. Oh my God, if I hit 603, not even deadlifting, if I do start doing specific right. deadlifting, I'm gonna be at 650 pretty soon. Yeah. But the dead, I sort of started deadlifting more and it beats me up. Yeah, and my deadlift actually went down because I started trying to up the deadlift volume. So it's like, for me, I've hit, I, and this is so funny, I've hit 600 probably like six times, all right? But my best deadlift ever was 620. Uh, I hit a, six, a 615 and a 610. The 610 I hit when I was doing one single a week of deadlifts. I mean, I'd warm up and do one single, and it would just be based on how I felt with 405. If 405 flew up fast, I'd try something big. If it felt heavy, I'd only go to like 515 or something. The, and then the 620 I hit when I was deadlifting three times a week, but I can't deadlift hard three times a week. So on Monday, it was super strict conventional. Now, conventional for a guy, okay, and this is an important consideration. <coughs> I'm a guy who likes to good morning his squats and round back and high hip his like, stiff leg round back my deadlifts, okay? Like my quads are never ever strong enough to, to, use, to use good form when I one rep max, all right? So I would do really strict deadlifts, you know? So even though I've pulled, my best conventional deadlift was 605, I would stick to like 405 and just be, have like lower hips and be really strict. That was Monday. Wednesday was stiff legs only with 315 for like three sets of five. Then Friday was sumos just up to a heavy single. That was when I hit my 620. And then I just told you the story when I wasn't, I was only doing stiff legs and I hit 603. And so I've had this awesome history of like deadlift strength. Now, uh, but that made me realize, crap, if I don't have to deadlift to be strong in deadlifts, why deadlift? Yeah. I, it, it, it's more like we, we worship the act of strength rather than being strong. Why do you care if at any point in time you can bust out a, a, a 500, 600 pound deadlift, at any point in time you can bust out like a 400 pound squat, but you don't even have to ever squat, or you can do tons of single leg work. You know, there's two studies, one on Bulgarian splits, once one on step ups, showing that they gain just as much squat strength doing step ups or Bulgarian splits once as the squat group did. Now, I wouldn't say that to the top power lifters. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, did yeah, you know yeah, you yeah, can yeah, only yeah. find <laughs> normal people, yeah, yeah, normal yeah. people like us, that works just fine. And so before- and you just feel so much better throughout the rest of the week. You feel better yeah. too. Like if you want a wall and yeah. do whatever, like if you're deadlifting all the time, or back squatting all the time. Not heavy. No, your athleticism is compromised. You're always banged up. And then your other workout suffering. Like if you do a heavy deadlift, the next workout, the next day, or 48 hours later, sometimes it's negatively impacted by that. But I have one more story I wanted to share. One time, I wanted to see the effect of just doing uh, like pretty much Smith machine squats and hack squats. Mm. And people bash Smith, Smith machine squats, but okay, I think people act like they're this totally different lift because they put their feet way out in front. Yeah. But what if you line up just like your regular squat and line up, because when you squat, you'll notice you're kind of leaned forward a little bit. What if you line up just Flat like that? Right. Yeah, yeah. So, I, but I feel Smith machine squats working the right way, like working my mind, I stay yeah. more upright, I use more quad, and I set up similar to my back squat, and then I would do hack squats. And I did that for six weeks and didn't do a single barbell squat. Interestingly, when I tested my one rep max back squat, I felt so wobbly, but I hit a PR. Really? I hit a 445 pound ass to grass full squat, and I hadn't done a single squat. I was just doing Smith machine and hack squats. Now, granted, my knees start hurting because the hack squats, they are so good for my quads, but they, my knees take a beating. Yeah. But this just goes to show you that you can build strength without doing the specific lifts. Right. And the, so I'm like you, I, I deadlift less frequency, less frequency now and less volume. I squat with less volume, but I still stay strong because now it's about, I don't think we have so much coordination gains to be, like we've, mm. we've squatted so many times, we've deadlifted so many times. You keep that skill, as long as you do it, you know, like once a week, even with a little bit lighter weight, you still keep the form and the skill down and you can build it with other lifts. Now here's a, here's a question then, because somebody might be watching going like, or, or listening to this and going, yeah, but I'm not, you know, 38, 40 plus, uh, I'm 20. 
does that go to say? I mean, because I fight, if I coach myself back then, I'd still say, do less of the big lifts. Don't take them out, but do less of them, do more of this stuff. And I feel like I'd have been less injured throughout my, even my, my basketball career and my lifting career, and I could have constantly progressed, right? So, like, what do you, what do you think on, because I've, I've heard you talk about this a lot, right? Like, if, if I don't know, somebody's like 26, 27, they're just kind of starting to lift and want to build strength and build muscle. Like, man, what's the advice? Is it the same advice? You know what I mean? Is it the same kind of thought yeah. process? So, so for me personally, I wish I could go back and train differently. For me as a coach, I think you learn so much from all the mistakes yeah, and, no, agree, and, yeah. and being injured. So I wouldn't change that. Uh, I, but I would like to be more jacked and less injured, <laughs> of course. But, um, but no, I would tell someone 26, 27 now, yeah, pay attention to what we're saying because I don't think you have to. Like, we've gone through that as coaches. We've gotten banged up take our advice, why would you want to get banged up? Like I think there's just smarter things about your execution, the way you sequence exercises like we did today, the choice of exercises. Like there's no reason to be married to a lift if it doesn't fit your structure. Like I'm saying, if it doesn't feel good, there's a million variations of squats you can do. You don't have to put a barbell on your back. So I, I think I, I would recommend anyone in their 20s to just start training smarter and think about what, what's the purpose. Like if you're playing football and you're gonna test it in certain exercises, okay, you gotta do them. If you're gonna power lift, okay, you gotta do them. Compete in CrossFit, okay. But if you just wanna be strong and jacked, which is the majority of people who train, train smarter. Yep, I, uh, I have a, a group of three women right now who I'm training for a powerlifting meet in June. And I told them, I'm like, I could have you guys squat three times a week right now and you get stronger, you gain strength quicker. I could have you deadlift twice a week, hard as hell, but I, I have them deadlifting twice a week. One day, they, I watch them and I make them, they're probably training five reps shy of failure mm. that day. Then they go hard on the other day, but I'm like, I'd rather slow cook you, because yeah. you, you won't get hurt. Yeah. Trust me, you, you will not get hurt, and I'm there to watch every rep. And that's how you make progress, being yeah. able to string up workouts for five, 10 not years straight. With, not just straight. with strength, but with physique too. Right. I'm like, yeah. I can't, you know, because most people come to me for their glutes, uh, for obvious reasons, but you know, I, I can't build your glutes if you're sidelined with, with an injury. So, you know, I think it was Dan John, like the goal is to keep the goal the goal. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, I think we've all kind of, as we've aged and progressed as, as lifters and as coaches, we have much more, more emphasis on more, more joint friendly training and like less just doing stupid stuff. like. I think we were all influenced by Arnold's like modern yeah. encyclopedia of body where he'd be like, I needed to shock my system and we'd go and do two straight hours of squats. <laughs> Stuff like that, you yeah. know? Like 50 sets of squats. Like, no, do not ever do that. Like yeah. do one set of squats and then two sets and then work your way up. And don't if you ever do a new routine, ease into it. Don't go crazy. I know like today you were smart. Those Nordics killed you yeah. and you did one hard set and you're like, yeah. I, and that's smart because yeah. You know, you can, I've had times where, you know, I'll, well, I keep bringing up Ben Bruno. He hadn't done calf raises in, in like, probably like five years. And he went and did like four hard ass sets of single leg calf raises, you know, probably holding on a dumbbell. Yeah, and if he, he couldn't like function for 10 days. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's no point in that. Why yeah. didn't he just do one set? Yeah. Like, we're idiots, we're, we're all idiots. It's really hard to, and you've got to screw up like a hundred times till you finally get a clue. You, you had a great point. I, I forgot when you said this, but it was like, uh, you know, even like a four week program, like week one, you're like 65 to 70% of an intensive and then you go up and then you're, you know, your last week, you really push, there's really one week where you push it and then kind of come back. And that's a smart way of just constantly progressing. And I, and I, I mean, and I used to do this too, is like where people are like week one, fucking go, right? Week two, try to go even harder, but then you get people that go like, man, I couldn't lift what I did last week. I'm like, you crushed yourself. Like, yeah. that's gonna be tough for you to, and then week yeah. three, you're even weaker, and you're like, oh, dude, this program's not working. It's, like, no, it's not the program, it's how you, how you execute it. Yeah, because yeah. fatigue, as that's what I tell people, fatigue masks fitness. You're not weaker, you're fatigued. So then you just train so hard today, you further fatigued yourself. You're like digging yourself into a hole. What you should have, and it's hard to do that when you have a crappy day. You're like, it's so hard to be like, I'm fatigued. I need to chill today, yep. not do much, and then just walk. You, you, usually, you'll be like, okay, well, oh, my strength sucks, so I'm just gonna drop down to 225 and bust out 30 reps or something, and then you fatigue yourself more. <laughs> and then you're like, why am I not getting stronger? But not only do I prioritize effort, as you mentioned, like have kind of like week one. But the thing about the effort thing. You can make lighter weights feel heavy. Mm -hmm. 
by being really strict with your form and tempo right. and stuff. So it's like the art of like, you still get a good workout on week one, but you're not going to failure and you're not pushing quite as hard. You're learning, mastering the form. And then week two, a little harder. Week three, a little harder. Week four, crush it. Then start over again. But you, I also, and I think this is something that I would love, uh, I don't know how I would do a study on this, but I'd love to do like a one year study if I had like a, in my dream world where I've got like all the, this lab and all these workers for me and all these participants. But I cycle exercises and we studied periodization. We read all the Russian texts, but it, they never talked about, so this is what I do and this is my system. I have a really, uh, a month where it's a well-rounded program. You know, on Monday, you're gonna squat and bench. On Wednesday, you're gonna do hip thrusts and military press. On Friday, you're gonna do uh, de deadlifts and chin-ups or something. Yeah, no. Maybe not chin-ups, but like maybe hip thrusts and chin-ups on Wednesday, then deadlifts and military. And then I still do some other stuff, but that's accessory lifts. You're not trying to set PRs. The main focus, so that's a well-rounded month, okay? Yeah. Then month two, it's a squat focus month. I have them squatting twice a week and doing singly, but it's first in the workout, mm -hmm. okay? Now, at the end of those four weeks, your knees are probably gonna be a little beat up. Yep. So then I switch to a hip thrust month, mm -hmm. okay? Because it's a little bit less taxing on the joint. Then I switch to a deadlift focus month, and you're gonna do hip hinging first. You still squat, but the deadlift month might be, well, the hip thrust month, you can hip thrust hard three days yeah, a week. Yeah. Because that's easy, there's so many variations. But one day might be a pause, one day might be knee banded for high reps, one day might be, you know, uh, just straight lower rep sets. Then the, then the, the um, deadlift focus month, it's like, it might be stiff legs on Monday, Wednesday might be dumbbell 45 degree hypers, because that's a hip hinge, and then Friday might be like sumo deads or, or trap bar or something. Then I have a single leg month. And because it's like after the deadlift month, your back might be beat up and you need a little bit of a break. And that single leg month is good for ironing out of balances. It's brutal too. And then it comes back around. And that's the system I use. And it works really well. Yeah, and okay. people don't get hurt too much, you know? But we never learned of that. Right. It was always, you periodize volume and intensity that's and, and, that's, and that's it. But you can periodize anything. You can periodize range of motion, you can periodize loads and effort and volume, you can prepare those exercises and the focus is so, the, I switch the focus each month. You're always gonna do the main movement patterns. You're gonna be squatting, hinging, bridging or thrusting. You're gonna be doing a single leg movement. You're gonna be uh, upper body pressing in the horizontal and vertical planes and upper body pulling. But you switch all the, 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 the focus in terms of what you do first and what you dedicate your mental energy towards. And you end up, cause it's, one of the reasons why I thought of this is I started coming across the research on maintaining strength. And I was like, holy shit, these subjects are like, they, they take six months to build up their strength and then they drop the volume by a third. And these people are doing three sets a week and maintaining their strength. It's very easy to maintain. Yeah, yeah. That's what we found, what yeah. we were just talking about. So if you can maintain it easy, why not? Because how hard is it to build your chin ups at this point in your life? Right. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The only way you're, the three of us are setting a chin up here is if we really, really focus on it. Well, you focus on it one month out of every five or whatever, and, and then, then you can actually set a few, and then yeah. you maintain yeah. it for yeah. a while. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my system, and I think it's a great system. That's a great system, yeah. great point. Because, and I love that you brought this up. Dude, I mean, I know you do a ton of, like I've started doing so much more single leg strength work, right? Yeah. So basically a whole phase where I'll do, you know, safety squat bar Bulgarians for sixes, and I can go up to 300 plus pounds, but my back feels great. Mm -hmm. Now, if I did even, I don't know, fucking 400 on a back squat, dude, I'm, I'm, my back is fried, there's no way. And to be able to rotate, and then I get excited when the month comes up, when you're like, okay, man, I've, I've, I've done a lot of maybe deads this month, now I've got a single leg and all the just assistance work, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and like you said, strength doesn't go down at all. Right, yeah. which is which is phenomenal. Because yeah. do you? I mean, how much do you right now? I do a lot of single leg stuff, and I feel so much better. Because you know, I mean, back. I mean, back squats. I know you're not doing. Yeah. But but even like heavy hinges and stuff like that, like and you're able to maintain. Well, I mean, if, if I train in a gym like this, oh, yeah, I would do all training. the stuff we did today. But yeah. usually, I'm training in a crappy gym, so I don't have that many options. So I tend to do a ton of single leg stuff. If I'm somewhere that has a glute ham, I'll do that. If it's a good leg curl, some leg curls, my knee feels like shit, and the right leg curl will feel good. So I'll hit those. Uh, good leg press is hard to find, um, but yeah, so I, I tend to do a ton of single leg stuff just based on the availability and where I'm training. But, but like my knees feel better, my hips feel better, my back feels better, and then when I do, uh, 
you know, traditional squatting movements, I do feel stronger. Not as strong as I was when I weighed 40 pounds more, but yeah, yeah. relatively now, I feel yeah. pretty good, yeah. It's funny, I remember uh, in my late 20s, um, first of all, I had this friend, Larry, he and I were like best buds in, in like college, and he, he would, we would push each other, and see those round dumbbells right there on the top left? Yep. Like those yeah. are 25 yeah. pounds. So yeah. That's the first purchase I made, right? Okay, <laughs> when I started buying my own equipment. So uh, those 25 pounders, we would do walking lunges with those. One set at the end, every Friday at the end of our workouts. So start out, and we, the first, I, I, I think Larry went and then I went and I got 50, okay? Then the next week he got 70. Then the next week I got 90. And then the next week he got 110. Then the next week he got 200. I only got 170, but I, I, went more distance than him because I was taller and take longer strides and we agreed we gotta stop because we're it was an eleven minute set. And you'd hold Jeez. those twenty five pound dumbbells for eleven minutes. Like are your forearms and traps yeah. would be yeah, yeah. but we'd get, we'd be like, okay, you're getting fifty in a row it was a breathing set. Right. You'd get fifty in a row and then <laughs> and then by by the last like seventy we're like one at a time. You wouldn't even go one one. You'd go one step. One step. And I've never had a point where I did ultra high reps like that mm. and it actually built my heavy strength. But we hit those lunges so hard. I remember when I went back to 155 barbell, I busted out like 30 reps. Like, like cause of my, I pushed it so hard on those. But uh, then I would read, and I remember when I built up to where, I couldn't do this now, but I was doing 225 pound walking lunges, which is pretty badass, right? Like, and I did 10 steps up, 10 steps back. That was like a milestone of mine. And I remember reading like back then like, well, lunges are for pussies, all these like big dudes. Yeah. And I remember being like, what? I remember when I did that 225 for 20, I racked it and I couldn't get my breath back. I, had, I remember I had a, like a stopwatch and it was 14 minutes until I did my next set. <laughs> so the other thing that you, uh, that you brought up and I was gonna bring up, is not like thinking about PR. Do you, like, do you do, you do this? Um, but like I started, cause I felt so much better PRing on like a 12, 15 or even a 20. You know, not always being like, I'm PRing on my three and five and sixes. I'd be like, yo, let me, like I got 120 pound dumbbells in the gym and I love doing RDLs. I was like, fuck, let me see if I can hit 25 with, with the 120s. And I progressed that. And so that's another system I'm doing right now which I've never heard anyone talk about. This is what I do with my girls. I say, pick a load and let's beat it. That's, you're gonna do two or three sets but only one is really hard. The other two, you stop, you, you, you pull the reins back a lot. It's just for, like if you're trying to build your one rep max strength, you need to do some heavy work, but it doesn't always have to be super heavy. Yeah. So, you got a lot of options here. Say they're squatting and I've got a, 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 a woman I'm training who can squat 225, okay? Her records might be 135 for 20 reps, 155 for 14 reps, 175 for 11 reps, 195 for six reps, 215 for four reps. But the, I'm just going by 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. You've got all these loads. So I'll say, what do you feel like doing today? You wanna go, but you gotta beat something. Mm -hmm. And so they'll go, okay, I think I'm gonna go, well, I got hip thrust. It might be, you know, I've got, I've got the strongest female hip thruster in the world training with me right now. And she's so strong. And I, she's as strong as I am at hip thrust. And she's hit 405 for 20. She's hit 500 for 10. She's hit 585 for three. She's hit 655 for one, okay? So I go, what do you want to do today? What do you want to beat? She's like, I think I want to try to beat 545 today. My record's eight. But that's her goal for the day. Yeah. But it's like, once you set a high rep record, you're ready for a low rep record. Once you set, so then her set might be, say, say on squats. She squatted uh, 275, okay? so. Maybe she goes for, I think she's at 225 for 10, she goes for 11. Yep. Then the next time, maybe we'll work up to, but well, after she does the 11, I have her try like a, a real strict single, which is 255. It's 20 pounds off her one rep max, but she keeps that one rep max coordination. Then the next week, maybe we go for one rep max. Then the next week, maybe it's a, it's not a fire, it's like a load. And it works really well, and I've never seen anyone it's like right about that. I've got all these ideas for like programs and. Like, cause everyone trained the same way. I remember uh, when I wrote my, I just finished my book, uh, Glute Lab, and 
I remember reading all up on periodization. I'm like, all anyone ever periodizes is volume and intensity. They never talk about switching exercise. They don't talk about like load, like pick a load and try. Like these are kind of things you learn being creative as a trainer, but they weren't like popular systems. And there's an intuitive appro uh, uh, approach to that too, because I'll ask them. And there is some research thing when you get them involved, they kind of know. Like it's a flexible system, they see better results when you ask for their input. Like, what do you feel today? What do you feel like going for? And they they can the keep that yeah. going for yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And they can keep beating it for weeks on end. And I don't deload them much because that system works out pretty well. Like they're not overdoing the volume. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember the first time uh, Joe Ken told me that he programmed uh, explosive power and speed stuff at the end. Well, then, it's like yeah. I've never seen an athlete that didn't have to be explosive in the fourth quarter. So that was a huge paradigm shift for me. But now it's. Not, you know, everyone is, you gotta program the big lift first. No, I always do it third now, second and third, like we did today. Like hip thrusts, leg curl, or glute, glute ham, or something like that, then I'll squat and I'll feel better. I'll do that on, on an upper body day too, like dumbbell press and then barbell press, second or third. Like maybe do a ring push up, a dumbbell press, and then a bench, and I feel so much better. And actually, a system that I've come up with for that, I haven't even told you this, I don't think I've talked about it a couple times in the podcast, is if people want higher frequency, but they still want to do that sequencing so you feel better. So let's say Monday's push day. So we'll do a ring push up, a dumbbell press, and a bench. And then to get the full body shit in that you don't need to warm up on, just do like high rep walking lunges and inverted rows. So that's your full body. Yeah. Then leg day, let's say you do glute ham, hip thrust, squat, and then push up and uh, chin or something yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't need to warm up on. And then on the pull day, sequence the pull shit so it's safe. Yeah, and then, it's yeah, safe. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which works really well. Yeah, I like that. And then, but the thing is, somebody, like, right, because it's so for, for people to conceptualize, it's like they're, they're looking at a template, they're going, yeah. oh, this doesn't make sense. And it's yeah. like, it fucking makes all the sense in the right. world because you said something feel, right? Yeah. And to, like, imagine that you're, you're coming in, you're doing your warm up, you're still feeling a little icky, and it's like, all right, listen, uh, we're going to start ramping up on the depths. And you're like, fuck, it. like, yeah. I'm, I'm not feeling my glute pump, you know what I mean? My upper back's not fine, I'm feeling tight. Like, you start doing that, you're, you're not gonna have a great fucking lift day. I don't give no. a shit. Like, I, I would, I would be do. much, uh, feel much better if I did like chest supported rows and hip thrusts and then go deadlift. Yeah. Now my yeah. whole fucking posterior chain, from my neck to my calves, is pumped. I feel good. Yeah. I like doing that much more. Exactly. How I know that even a, like, there, there are even times where if I bench first and then go into like a lower body lift, I feel yeah. better. It's just something about. Right. Yeah. Like, it's not just the blood flow warming up. Yeah. It's something about the nervous system relaxes, yeah. and if the next lift, you're you're more loosened up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, I like that system because, like what you said, you, you don't want to do the after the leg stuff, do push ups and inverted rows. You you can just walk right into them and yeah. bust them out. Yeah. People are always like, "Well, how many warm up sets do you do?" And I'm like, you, "You warm up a lot for your first yeah. couple yeah. lifts, yeah, yeah. And, and you're gonna warm up more with squats and deadlifts and bench press. But like some lifts." Like, yeah, hip thrust, you guys walked right into them today yeah. with, you didn't, you know, we did a little like right. 10 minute dynamic warm up and then you walked right into them. Yeah. You didn't have to do, you don't have to do like three warm up mm -hmm. sets for, if, if you're doing higher reps, if you're gonna like try like a heavy set of hip thrust, but if you're just, you know, doing higher rep sets, your first set could be a working set. You know? yes. so, that's another topic that's hard to explain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, how do, I, I wanted to add, like, ask you, like, where do you feel, man? Where does conditioning fit in? Right. This is this is another tough one when um, you know you talk to people. Like, like I said, you know, general, like, hey, I want to get jacked. I want to look lean. Like, where do you plug in conditioning? And how much of it? What type of cardio? Where does it fit in? Um, if you're kind of looking, I mean, I, I hate the word average, but if you're kind of looking like the average person that wants to put on some muscle, day, you know, look better, like where do you plug that? Um, I don't think you're gonna like my answer, but I've kind of moved away from all the cardio because you have to think of the population that we work with. And it's funny, because I talk a lot about like people overdoing on cardio. I talk a lot about volume, people overdoing volume. And a lot of my followers will be like, what is he like? Cause they're thinking like, like three fourths of the world is like sedentary and they need to do more exercise. But then there's the other end of the spectrum where they're like freaks, like, like, like addicted to exercise and they do way too much. And there's been a few new studies that have been published that show you can do too much where you're completely spinning your wheels. For example, a study on German volume training, the five set of 10 group saw better results than yep. the 10 by 10 group. Um, so we did a lot of that probably growing up where we went and did too much. So, but the same with cardio, people get, like I like to use cardio because I train a lot of competitors, like bikini competitors and physique competitors. 
use that not as your year-round baseline, use it for when you really need to dial it in. If you use it, because I remember training this bikini competitor once, she's like, I'm training three times a day, six days a week right now. I do cardio, I do plyos. Why are you doing plyos? Yeah, that's a, that's still a thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do plyos and I do weights. And like, she's like, but I need, I need to get more that's shredded. That's super combine. <laughs> and then I'm like, how much are you eating? And she's like, I eat like, you know, 1500 calories a day and exercising three times a day. How the, what am I gonna do? Yeah. How can I possibly get you in better shape without like harming you? So yeah. what, what that person needs to do is like take, don't compete for a whole year. Mm -hmm. Take the time. So you set your base, your baseline in my opinion should be, you lift weights five days a week for an hour and you walk. And you have a step count. I agree. And it's like yeah. uh, you get the three days, days a week. Or even yeah, three yeah, days yeah, a week. Yeah. Three days full body. Yeah. Five days if you like to split it. Uh, and it, like if, if you like to go, if you if you can get to where like you feel fine doing three days a week and you know because you'll see good gains. But yeah. a lot of people are like I don't feel right. Like the gym yeah. is my. Then maybe split it, but don't try to do five hard full body days a week. Yeah. That's why I made my compound growth system. Mm -hmm. like, the heavy and then in between are like the high rep pump yeah, days. Yeah, pump for the people who are like addicted to actors that they need their fix, it's a way they can still see gains. But anyway, and then have your daily step count as like 15,000 steps a day. And if you're doing that, you're gonna be, cause you get about a thousand steps every 10 minutes. So if you have 15,000 steps, that means 150 minutes you were walking. That's pretty good. I'm oh, sorry, you're not. <laughs> um, you were walking for basically two hours and 30 minutes out of the day. That's a lot of walking. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're active. And then they don't have to do cardio because they were walking all day. Now, you save the cardio for times you're trying to prep. But that's, you're thinking of the average client, how to get their conditioning up. And I don't do a lot of that. But there's, you know, I know that if I did, the one thing I would do differently than a lot of people do, I would say, do things that are joint friendly. Don't jog every single day. Mix it up. And don't, you know, don't do like, if you're already lifting heavy, like, you don't need to do like, you know, one of the barbell complexes we used to do. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I hated yeah, those. Yeah, I, mean, I don't like the yeah. The band. I hated them. Like yeah, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, but I don't do any of those anymore because you could just have them push a sled. Yeah. Or you could just run hills. Or you could like, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that are very easy that are joint friendly to do, but also mix it up. Yeah. Don't get, because, you know, you can get kind of like an overuse. Don't Same like so. cycle one day, totally. incline yeah. treadmill another day. That's what I would do. Yeah. But there's, there's also the consideration of most people are parked out, you know, their adrenals are fried, yeah. they're drinking this all day, <laughs> no sleep. So if you're gonna lift three to five days and then go do super hard hit conditioning all the time, like you're just frying yourself yeah. and you're gonna get worse results. Your strength gains, your muscle gains are gonna be worse. You're not gonna enhance fat loss. Uh, so I, I agree with you. More low intensity stuff, strength training is, is, is the main priority. And then I think if you could add in, honestly, for an average person, if, if you want to do something high intensity, I mean, in 1985, I started doing hill sprints because of Walter Payton, my favorite athlete ever. So if you could do that once a week, an additional like three or four hard strength days, I think that's plenty. And then the low intensity stuff, walking for sure. But then if you want to do one or two low intensity exercise, like maybe you'll, you'll go uh, on the airdyne, the rower, and the, uh, the skier for 30 minutes and keep your heart rate. 150. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, it's, so it's more, the, the benefits are active recovery, kind of just the mental benefits, you know, it's almost meditative, you recover faster. Because I used to be a guy who thought that that would take away from my size and strength gains, but it actually enhances, you do feel better. And for me, I don't know about you, being over 40, if I move every day, I feel better. If I take a full day off, I actually don't feel that great. So just moving, just hiking, doing anything, I feel better. Yeah, I also, because I train most people for physique purposes, I tell them, and then I, I learned this when I saw the studies that were published on people's, like how exercise tended to affect people's appetites, and it's all over the place. Yeah. You had this guy, they plotted everyone's individual response. So it's funny, it reminded me of my friend who, uh, like this this guy that I knew in college, this back when remember when ephedrine was legal, <laughs> my friend's right to the like, store. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he would lose 20 pounds just in a month of taking a feather. It yeah. made him not hungry. Yeah. That was the same guy though, as if you want to lose weight, he just started doing high intensity and he swore by it. And I'd do it and I'm like, I don't notice anything. Yeah. And if I took a feather and I didn't notice anything, it doesn't, I'm just a hungry guy. Right. I, was eating. <laughs> I remember around 
Carver, when did foam rolling become a real big thing? About 10 years ago? So. About 10, 10, 10, 10 yeah. Ago, yeah. yeah. And I remember being like, oh, like, do you remember like growing up reading, like yeah, I'd read like the Bulgarian weightlifting team had like, my, uh, or maybe it was Raja, they had like massage therapists that would massage Daily. in between <laughs> each session. And they'd lift three times and I was like, Man. I thought you were gonna have that here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, man, if I had, a massage therapist, I could lift three times and it would greatly accelerate my recovery. And then I learned, you know, these like review papers showing that massage doesn't actually, I mean, you when you were lift weights, you damage things and those have to repair. You can't just, a lot of these things people think, well, I'm gonna stretch. Well, you can damage things more by stretching yeah. a lot of times. But I also was like, man, I, I would feel guilty. And you don't want to feel guilty when you're already working out really hard. That's not feeling like you're not doing enough. Uh, and I'd be like, man, I need to be foam rolling. I should be uh, doing, taking contrast showers at night. Or like, I should be doing this. I should be doing this. And then you're like, you're never satisfied with what the effort yeah. you're putting out. But also, how about this? And people will be like, what should I be doing for active recovery? How about this? If you like reading, take that 30 minutes you would have done without uh, uh, active recovery and just read in the sun or something. Or, yeah. or if you like watching a, a show that you don't have enough time to watch a, a certain sitcom or something, watch that or do anything you enjoy. Yeah. You'll probably be less stressed out, right. you'll enjoy life more and you'll see better results. You'll sleep better and you'll see totally. better results yeah. in the gym. I love that answer because people overcomplicate and I think fitness kind of ruins their life sometimes where they're just obsessed 24-7. Yeah. Yeah, active recovery. Nothing. Just go do whatever you like. Yeah, you'll be yeah. happier. For active recovery, yeah. I want you to find Get an extra hour of sleep. Yeah, what's well, yeah. one thing you love doing and do that. That's yeah. your homework. Well, because you. you know, like, you, you'd think, right, that people don't train a lot, mm -hmm. but then the studies show that, like, Americans actually train. In the last 16 years, the average woman trains double what she used to, mm -hmm. and the average guy trains 60% more. Wow. Right? We have, we're more active than, I mean, the Japanese have, like, what, 4% of these? They did five, mm -hmm. something like that. They don't really do too much, right? But then, Americans actually are starting to train more than any other population on the planet. Mm. And obesity has gone right up, actually more than double. So now yeah. if you think about that, yeah. you go like, everybody's like, well, well, what's the thing to do? Well, we need to go four times a week, high intensity training, let's do this, let's you know, lift heavy. But it's like, no, you actually be more conservative would give you better results. Chilling the fuck out for would give yeah. you better results. And just having some type of structure that you consistently can do long term would make you win. Because yeah. because the thought process, what would you hear everybody say? Uh, eat less, move more, yeah. right? But statistically, if you look at it, actually people are moving. Well, I'm not saying that everybody's moving more as much as they should, but it's good. That trend has gone up significantly, mm -hmm. and so that's not necessarily the issue, right? It's like yeah. there's a, a there's a huge segment of population. I think there's 23% of Americans have gym memberships now. That's a lot. I mean. Mm -hmm. For what, trust me, no other no other country has that. I'll right. tell you that right off the bat. You go to Slovenia, dude, there's no way there's 23% of people. But guess what? You go and hike up a mountain, there's a 73-year-old couple and they're fucking like going past you. Passing what the fuck? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's crazy. And so I think that's really, really important because there's so many arguments about, you know, what you should do to get jacked and you gotta do this and you gotta do that. And it's like, man, like, what could you do for the next 10 years consistently without having to take a break is probably a good idea, right? I mean, I think Americans were so extreme. Yeah. Like, we can't have things legalized here because we're spazzes with everything. You know? like, <laughs> you know, we legalize certain things that are legal in other countries and probably blow up on us because yeah. we're such spazzes and we're like, what, with everything? If, like yoga, we'll find a way to make it like... Hot. Right. And, like, and weighted. Get around weighted yoga. You know, like, <laughs> My gym, glute train, glute train is good. Well, I'm gonna do, you know, <laughs> you know like, uh, anyway, but uh, yeah, I think these other cultures like that, that might be, you know, like Okinawa is one of the blue zones and you study these cultures and it's like, they're just less stressed. And I think it goes along with like the American dream. I've learned that I can, if I focus on my physique, I can get in good shape. If I focus on my self-improvement as a human being, because that's hard to do. <laughs> you really have to focus on it. I can do that. Or if I focus on my business, I can crush it, but I cannot do two or three at a time. It's gotta be one. And, uh, but yeah, it's, I think part of the problem is we're more focused on the money and the business and you hear, I mean, how many times do you hear like, this guy's 
this guy's making all this money and you're like, shit, I could do that. Yeah. He's doing this, I'm gonna start doing that. And I, I started, because being having a gym in San Diego, I meet all these influencers. They, they like, you know, someone will DM me and I don't even know who they are, but I see the blue tip and I'm like, okay. And they're like, hey, I'm in town. And they've got like a million followers or a million five hundred thousand followers. And I'll go out lunch with them and, and I'll always ask them like, what do you do? How's your business work? I have an app. I do, I have a pay website. Oh, I just do ebooks. I'm like, I don't do ebooks. I don't have a pay site. I don't have an app. I could do all those. But yeah. what people don't realize is most of the influencers I've met have one thing mm -hmm. and they're killing it. The second you start having like eight so kids, you we don't do well with all of them. Because yeah. 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 I'm going, okay, I'm doing pretty well right now. But if I did an app and I did ebooks and a pay site, it, do, it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't work that way. Most powerful word is no. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you try to focus on a couple things that you can do well, but also that you enjoy doing. I like that's the, the, the that's revenue streams that I do. That's it's not torture key. for me. That's a big but a lot of these other co countries, they're just not so focused on right. money. They're more focused on the social connectedness and the fa familial and the relationships. And that's the biggest predictor with like longevity totally. happiness. Yeah. and happiness. We don't do enough of that. Yep. And I know for me, I can completely isolate myself and just be in my little zone. And then I'm like, I'm not the best family member. I'm not the best friend. It's funny, I've been trying to ask my glute squad more about them, but I realize I don't know anything about any of them. I just blast music and order them around <laughs> and never ask them about themselves. So I'm trying to do more of that right yeah, now, yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a, I think that's a great point because on both fronts, right? First of all, if you love it, you can do it forever. And you can build on it. Like we were just walking down the street yesterday and Jay's like, oh shit, like this one thing, like you should build this one thing and like I enjoy this one thing. And we all get away from it. Like I, I think we've all done that, right? Where, where it's like you, you think you gotta do this thing because somebody else is doing it, and then you pursue it. And you're like I don't even fucking like this. <laughs> so if you don't like this, even if you did well financially, sooner or later you're gonna burn it to the ground and be like, God, this, who cares about this? But if you love it, it's kind of like training, right? Think about it. Go slower so you don't get injured, and you'll get stronger over time. You know, you love this stuff, dude. Do it slower, consistently build it, and like over time, you'll build a you know a great business that you actually love and enjoy. Yeah, so it kind of goes in line with that philosophy, I think, you know. And with that said, uh, we got to get done because we can definitely like you know, talk about this for forever. I mean, pretty much. Um, any closing thoughts, guys, that you wanted to? I don't care what they are, whatever comes to your mind, something that you want to share. Um, along the lines of our last um, topic of conversation. Uh, you also should do what you're good at and it takes a while to or like do what you like and what you're good at like people think I'm a good writer and I had a very popular blog but I'm I was a high school math teacher for six years like I have a mathematics background and I think my articles and blog posts and you know I've even published a, like 50 journal studies or I'm on 50 papers but I actually the only reason my captions and things are good is because I take I spend so long on them I am a slow writer, I'm not efficient at it. So I've gravitated, and probably you guys can relate, like we're like meatheads. We're not like English literary geniuses. So you guys, you know, you have a podcast, you've done, I do more, like you're a great speaker at seminars and stuff, so you do more speaking things. If you're a great speaker, do, do podcasts, do yeah, YouTube, do things like that, do Instagram TV. If you're not that good, if you don't like speaking and you're not that good, then do more writing things, right? Have a blog post, have to write ebooks, things like that. But it's, I think it takes a long time to figure out what you are good at and then what you enjoy. You know there's that graphic, it's like what you enjoy doing, what you're good at, and what makes, what actually like pays money. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And find, find the intersection. Find the intersection yeah. of those. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a great point. Jay, I bet you better finish with some wisdom. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got another to add on top of that. I, mean, I agree with that. Um, that's it. I never, yeah, I think, I think I, I I never thought I'd get you like catch you being stuck on some I know. Um, hey, all the buzz in his <laughs> <laughs> Hey, well, check, check uh, if you guys have not checked out, I mean, obviously, these guys at Jay Ferrugia, um, at Brett Contreras1 on, on Instagram. Get Brett's new book, it's phenomenal. Uh, believe it or not, I have read through it. I'm, I'm weird like that. Uh, I read your shit ton. It's, it's, it's great for 30, what, five bucks? 35 bucks if you don't get it. It's part of kick to the chest. Um, and with that, next, I'll see you in the next Real Life uh, episode podcast. Peace out.